uh, barista from Ben as well. And it's one of the issues that our last guest just touched on before he stepped out. The issue of successionist agitations across Nigeria. Different regions with some anti-state groups clamoring for their own rights in their own stead. And this has become an issue that has plagued Nigeria over the years. Now, let's see if we have our connections well with to have our guests join us virtually from our Uyo studios. Hello, good morning to Barrister Mfon Ben and Citizen Matthew Okono. Nice to see you, gentlemen. Can you hear us? Yeah. All right, I'm not alone. I also have Chijo Kyokafo with me in the studio as well. And we'll be looking at this issue. And particularly, let's start with the issue in the southeast. One of the issues that has been most vocal uh, following the civil war in Nigeria. Now, the Biafra secessionism has had different angles to it. There have been issues on the part of the ESPN, IPOP. There's been the fractions led by Namdi Kanu. There's that led by Simon Ekba. And these are issues that persons continue to ask with a sit-at-home order in the southeast. How does the government of the day approach this matter in a bid to resolve in it? Oh, Citizen Mazi, you care to go first? Mazi, you care to go first? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for having me and my colleague, Barista. Uh, the issue of um, the agitations in South has different dimensions. The ESN and then the sit at home order is not actually born out of agitation for self determination. We must be able to have the facts right. Those, the sit at home order came as a result of the uh, arrest, as um, I think the court said at one point that it was an illegal arrest because uh, the Nigerian government did not go through the due process of extradite. Kanu, who is the leader of the indigenous people of Biafra. So, in the course of agitating, his foot soldiers now decided to bring out some initiatives that has to do with the sit-at-home sit order. That of the ESN, the Eastern Security Network, did not come to strengthen their agitation for self-determination. It came as a result of the infiltration by murderous headers who were killing and raping women, and those people said they need to protect their territory. The facts are there. The agitation has a life of its own. But this additional aspect of the security network, which now became it's still a very big problem as we speak. And the state at home has to do with the agitation for the release of Manzi Namdi Khan, Namdi Khan, the leader of ICOP. So we need to get those facts clear. But for the self determination angle, uh, Namdi Khan is just a letter day advocate for the liberation or what they call self determination for Biafra to be seen as a, a country of its own, or maybe call it a nation, because the South is has, has a lot of, lot of um, issues. So uh, we've had uh, the, the, the other uh, MASO, uh, what was it called now? A number of other agitators. The Wazduriki was the most renowned until Mazinam Kanu appeared in the scene, and Waziriki's group of agitators, their voice really came down. And even he himself is not as vocal as before. So we, we must have those issues in perspective. Otherwise, not everything to get, it would not help those who are not aware to have the understanding. The issue of internal for the Southeast was born out of headers, infiltration, and killings. And then the sit at home is to put pressure on the Nigerian government to consider Namdi Kanu, who I think the court 
said that the federal government didn't have any reason to, to still hold on to him. So that is my take on that very aspect. Now, now, you had earlier mentioned Masob and IPOB and ESN as, you know, uh, groups that have been created as part of the struggle of, uh, you know, the, the Biafran people for succession right from time. But many people have argued that there is some sort of division amongst people who are agitating for you know, the succession of Biafra from Nigeria, considering the fact that you have different groups, like the, the movement for the actualization of the suffering uh, state of Biafra, Masob, and of course, IPOB and ESN. However, now, you have these groups that started off as, you know, agita uh, agitation groups for succession becoming violent, like the ESN has been fingered in some sort of attacks in the southeastern part of the country in recent times, saying that instead of protecting the people of the southeast, they have turned around and are now killing, kidnapping, and maiming people. How did we get here? And, and how can we create a clear disparity between all of these groups? ESN is not a standalone successionist group. ESN is the Eastern Security Network that was created by Mazin Namdekan as part of the IPOP uh, group. And Masop, we've, we've not, we have not about them, but we must understand. If you have 5, 10, 20 uh, secessionist groups, if their desire is one, there's nothing wrong. It's like having social culture program, as long as they don't fight among themselves. Because if you are looking even at the West, we have the Yoruba Nation group, they are other pan Yoruba groups who are also agitating for self determination for the Yoruba, Yoruba people. Odua, uh, whatever, Odudua. people's movement and all of that. So, but in the Southeast, to be specific, ESN is not a secessionist group armed wing of IPOP. And like I said earlier, it doesn't matter the number of groups agitated for self-determination if they are not fighting themselves or causing problems, they have to exist as long as their desire uh, is, is won. But the aspect of violence is what should concern us because like we have seen, ESN had been fingered in the killings of the maiming and killing of men of the Nigerian military in the southeast. Very terrible sight that we have been seeing. And apart from maybe political killings and all of that, their target is well defined. And the government should know what to do about that. For the sit at home order, they are the ones that enforce the sit at home order. Well, so, citizen Matthew O'Connor, we thank you for trying to create this disparity between different groups and what they're agitating for. At this point, let's take a listen to Barrister Mfon Ben. Now, Barrister, the question is, in this agitation and in keeping with the provisions of the law, when does agitation become unconstitutional? Looking at the Biafra movement, which has spanned back to the Civil War, and the new agitations in the Yoruba nation and uh, more in the Niger Delta with what we had as militancy, which is taking new forms this day. In keeping with the rule of law, when does issues like this become unconstitutional? The Nigerian constitution does not provide in any section a definite answer for the procedure to succeed. That's the first thing we should understand. And so every aspect that comes with diseases of the national cohesion becomes an offense. And that was part of the uh, felonious trial of Shibabala uh, um, Awolowo. That is part of the history that led to that trial. Part of the things he was accused of was secessionist um, agitation. And so we want to be very, very definite on this uh, subject matter. We have to look at the historical background and the current trend and what are the aspects definitely pushing, what is pushing the sessions. 
and that should be concerned for now. Some of um, but Barista Mfon, we think we have a technical glitch on your part. We will come back to you once we can sort out the microphone issue. We're hoping that uh, our technicians at the other side in the old studio would also take a look at it. But it's also important to note, TJK, what he yes. said in terms of the constitution not being entirely clear as to when it becomes unconstitutional. And these are questions we discussed about on the constitution reforms. Now, in light with these comments, do you think that in formulating a new constitution like many agitating for we need to have that clear line on when agitations become unconstitutional especially when the lives of men of our armed forces are lost in keeping the peace of nigeria well well in the first place i don't believe a, a sovereign nation like nigeria would want to include in its constitution the possibility of a succession no nation in today's world would want to allow for such a thing to happen it is a very huge destabilizing factor in any country, no matter how big or small it is. I mean, Russia is way bigger than Ukraine, but look at the, the conflict that is, you know, rocking that uh, region of the world. And, and if you narrow it down to Nigeria, if there is a constitution review that gives room for the possibility of a... To outlaw it. To outlaw it. To out, either outlaw it or to even give it a chance of happening then you will start seeing groups springing up from states, not even regions now, demanding for succession, where you will find perhaps Gombe states, uh, people asking for Gombe, for their own Gombe country. Nation. Gombe nation. You, you find uh, the uh, Bielsa people asking for their own Bielsa uh, nation, and not even the Niger Delta agitation as a whole now. So if you give room for that, there will certainly be a degeneration of law and order in the country and what you're seeing with with ipop what you're seeing with the odudua uh, people's republic what you're seeing with the niger delta militancy which has sort of gone down is going to be a child's play compared to the madness that will spring up in the country well, well let's go back to Uyo now and uh, see if we have better connection to get the thoughts of bystam fun and citizen matthew o'connor well, gentlemen, I'm hoping that we have a better connection now. Let's speak of where we left off with Bystam Fon. Uh, seems to be a, a technical glitch of sorts uh, and uh, we're still struggling to hear by some fun but if you're just joining us it's a broad conversation and in different regions of the country from the niger delta to the southeast and now to the southwest with the yoruba agitations some of these groups feel marginalized they have different uh clamors or should i say agitations some want to be outrightly removed or expunged from being part of nigeria as a country some others want to be better included in our principle of federal character these are some of the issues that over time governments of the days have had to deal with now much like chijoke rightly said with the militants in the niger delta amnesty was granted a lot of them laid down their weapons but despite these strategic interventions the cry of marginalization with the abandonment of projects like the east west road continue to be a huge issue they complain of having have uh, having housed the nation's commonwealth but it is not evidently seen in the infrastructure when you talk about the housing deficits being a water locked part of the country yes they still complain about having basic social amenities despite having environmental degradation Tearing up the environment. Now, now Bito, it, it, we always want to, you know, address issues with the current circumstances that are visible to the eyes. But if you want to really understand uh, the agitations of a people, you must understand where it actually... You the know, historical the antecedents. historical antecedents. Now, if you remember the Aburi Accord that happened in, in Ghana in 1967, leading up to the Civil War, where, you know, uh, led by uh, Cornell, then Cornell uh, Odumego Juku, he led the Igbo 
elders delegation to Aburia court to have a negotiation with the federal government to agree not to use any form of violence to solve the internal crises in the country as at the time, similar to what is currently happening in Nigeria right now. Now, the Aburi Accord was signed, but just a few months after, a civil war broke out. The agitators of the Biafran succession, many decades down the line, are calling for a referendum, something similar to the Aburi Accord that happened in Ghana in 1967. Now, this referendum that they are calling for I, I certainly do not have details into what exactly they want to discuss in the or at the referendum, but I believe it is perhaps either a way of bettering the region so that they don't succeed, or a way of allowing them allowing them succeed under certain conditions, which has happened in several several countries of the world in the past. However, all these years that the you know, IPOP group, Masob, and the rest have been crying out for some sort of referendum to have discussions with the federal government. No talks of referendum has been has come out from the quarters of, of any federal government at all. Successive governments, right from the time of uh, President uh, Alusha Gono Basanjo, leading up to uh, the, the current administration of the day. So I think that perhaps, even if the federal government would not allow for a succession to take place, there is, there should be a place of negotiation. Just the way there was a negotiation with the Niger Delta militants, an amnesty was granted, they laid down their arms, and now the Niger Delta region is experiencing so much peace and bliss, unlike when militancy was at its, you know, highest in the region. So, from my perspective, the federal government should come to a roundtable discussion with members of IPOP. Firstly, the detention of Nambikanu and his continuous trial for years has been an issue that has continued to fuel the agitation in the southeastern part of the country. If Nambikanu continues to stay in DSS detention, to stay in facilities where he is being held, I think these agitations will not, will not die off anytime soon and there will continue to be killings. So let us look at it from an objective point of view and try to find a common ground for these people who have been crying out for decades. Now, a point to take away from what Chijoke has said is the position of a referendum. And this is one of the agitations on a broader note with calls for reform of Nigeria's 1999 constitution as amended. Would now attempt to cross back over to our Uyo studios with the hope that we have better connection. Well, hello, gentlemen in New York. Can you hear us better? Let's uh, re-attempt to pick up where we left off by Stamfon. I agree with you to the extent that a constitutional conference will be necessary and has been done before to address some of these issues, but they were never implemented. And so the problem has been decisions that are never implemented in addressing some of these issues. And so when you talk about these agitations that are coming up today, the new set of agitations are mostly political that are calling for negotiation than actual crap. Not for the people. Now, Barry Stamphon, Ben, uh, it's quite unlikely that we're having this interruption in the network, but I also would agree with you because over time it has not been the lack of confabs or referendums. The issues are that they have been beautiful recommendations on paper and successive governments have failed to implement it. Now, the question marks are whether it's on the political will to do so or is it the right time? We keep on having these issues of timing being part of the consideration made by successive governments. Yeah. Now, very recently, many will be asking what agitations feel like, especially from different regions. But one issue I think a lot of Nigerians agree with is the issue of insecurity. One of the solutions that was preferred was the case of state policing. But despite a national dialogue on Nigeria's police reforms, it was almost like a common echo around the hall about the timing. We heard former President Dr. Goodluck Jonathan also talk about it being 
a very good idea fears on the state governors usurping it but if issues like state police which would better our security challenges in the, in the country are still greeted with the echo of doubt on the timing in terms of implementation how much more bigger issues like secession well well uh, on the issue of state policing i remember that uh, regionally we had um, we still do have uh, groups like the Ebubago in the southeast and of course the Amotekun in the uh, uh, southwest where you know these groups were organized to sort of mitigate the effects of insecurity in the region which at some point was almost starting to uh, overwhelm the security forces within that region. At the initial stages these groups that were created recorded some sort of reasonable progress. But over time, we have been seeing a steady decline in their effectiveness. We've been seeing a steady decline in even their, the, the, their operations within this region. Now, this perhaps is owing to a number of factors, maybe funding from the state government, but the state governments within the region, uh, and maybe people just set, suddenly losing interest in that particular drive. Certainly, you would not have people who are just gathered up and asked to join a security network or some sort of uh, group where they are taxed with the responsibility of policing the state. They are not trained professionals as much as you would have people in the military or pa paramilitary or the police, you know, operate. These are well-regimented, well-trained people who know their responsibilities and carry them out accordingly. Now, another angle to it is we could have explored the concept of vigilante groups in the country which are scattered all over the nation we have vigilante groups however these vigilante groups somehow have now been relegated to almost especially in the northern part of the country you can't even differentiate between a vigilante and a hunter you have hunters association serving as vigilantes you have vigilante associations serving as hunters association so so the, the the entire concept of state policing is a very fantastic one but has been badly implemented in the country by certain states now i'm talking about certain states let's uh, re-attempt to join uyo to get the thoughts of citizen matthew o'connor now my co-host chijo kiyokafo has uh, made a case for some states especially with the hunter headers issues we've seen the amoteku in the southwest a place where the yoruba agitation has also evolved find a, a clean balance between ensuring some level of sanity with what many would constitute as a unique state police in that case do you think that this can be replicated in curbing some of the issues of violence in certain states Well, Citizen Matthew O'Connor, can you hear us? Again, please. Uh, we're talking about the agitations and the involvement of certain security networks, much like the Amotekun in the Southwest, where they've been able to keep the peace and reduce incidences of farmer header clashes. Do you think that in curbing some of these incidences with insecurity that have metamorphosed into great agitations, that can be replicated as a case study? Well, I didn't quite get you, but you mentioned Amotegun, and um, I, I am a stickler to putting issues in proper perspective. I, I wish we had a better network where we would have looked at how many areas, how many sections of the countries are actually looking for uh, self-determination, and um, like what um, Samuel, I mean, Sonny Buhu, uh, he went to meet the UK Prime Minister to submit a petition. Uh, for, for me, me uh, that, that is for sure. sure. Where, Where he will have gone to will have been United Nations. Nations. And it and may surprise some of us, there's a group, uh, Ibom People's, People's Movement, that have actually, actually gone, gone to United uh, Nations, Nations to submit their the petition that the Akwaibom people, people will want to uh, be a country on its own because of the activities of the pro Biafra agitators who want to lump other sections of the country into their agitation. Uh, Kwaibom is not part of Biafra. So Ibom People's Movement 
led by uh, Professor Fionn Okua, went to the United Nations. So that's where Sonny Bowen would have gone to. And Motegun is not a self-determination uh, uh, security arm. And Motegun, just like Ebibagu, was set up by the government of the Southwest. Was set up by the government of the Southeast after they failed to do something about this security in that region. And the IPOP now set up the Eastern Security Network. So it was a face saving measure, and Ebibagu has not really done much. So what is not part of the Yoruba nation agitation? We need to get that because we do not see the activities as being a terrorist group or using violence to suppress anybody, unlike the kind of things we see where you have in the north. I must say this. There is a tactical restructuring going on. You find that when the man in Sanfara, Yerima, went against the Nigerian constitution, to enshrine Sharia as a legal system in Sanfara State. Other than states, they went for it. That's the, the constitution because Nigeria is a secular state. No state should adopt a religion. That alone by itself is a form of secession. And now you now talk about the principle of destroying dreams in the north. But they go to shops and destroy drinks worth billions in as much as the business is still going on. So that by itself, too, is a form of uh, self determination. Now, the way forward is what I'm really saying. The way forward is that there are fundamental issues about the structure that must be addressed. If the structure of this country is not addressed, the idea or issue of self-determination will get to the point because self-determination itself is a basic human right and it's contained in the United Nations Charter, which Nigeria It does not matter if we have it enshrined in our laws. After all, we have read that some of our forebears needed to put referendum in the but others said no, it should not be adopted. So our concern itself, which most have said, is a decree, and that's why it's actually a decree. We need to have a people's constitution. But even if for a simple practice of faith, our faith units, I'm not for regions. People say, let it be regional. No. States should be the component unit of the people of Nigeria. And for as long as country, it will get to the point that they will find that they have brought us to the precipice, and God forbid, that's why we need to raise our voices very high. All these politicians, they, are, they will solve very terrible political problems in a jiffy. But when it comes to national question, they don't even want to attempt to answer. And the issue of national question is a compulsory question. And citizens must rise up to demand to call themselves rulers, which is impossible. Nigerians are already in in, in, in crisis of, because of the economy and suffering and. I mean, so much. We cannot allow self-determination that can be solved at the first stage with proper practice of federalism instead of this military system. Otherwise, I feel for us as a people, but it will be an indictment that certain persons were in office and they had a point to address even what they themselves, for instance, as Wajibola Mitunumbu, is a pro-democracy uh, activist. He is also a pro Federation Acti uh, activists and the book says if states are allowed to operate as federating units, and no, no. the local government itself will be part of the state as development centers, not a third tier, because there cannot be a third tier, a federation. You only have two the sector and the state. 
Local governments should be on that state as development centers. Now, now, so it is a mark for, for, for most people who, you know, heard the news of Sunday Boho visiting uh, the UK and, you know, presenting a petition for the Yoruba nation. Uh, the, 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 the question that is on the minds of most Nigerians is why agitating for, you know, self-determination at a time when uh, the region is, is perhaps experiencing uh, a lot of, um, you know, development, a lot of uh, prosperity. And, and, and it appears to, obviously, the, the current president is part, you know, of the Yoruba people. So many people are just wondering, why at this point, why agitating for uh, self-determination in that region? It appears that uh, there's still a bad connection there with uh, your mic, Barrister Ben, but we hope to rectify that in just uh, a jiffy. Now, still coming back to you as a citizen, uh, Mart O'Connell, let me also get your take on this. I, I believe, uh, much like uh, the IPOB or Biafran agitation, where there is some sort of, you know, deeply rooted cause from the 1960s or thereabouts, and uh, the Niger Delta agitation that we all know what the cause is all about. Many people are wondering why the Odudua, uh, you know, Odudua uh, People's Nation uh, agitation by Sunday Boho leading up to him visiting the UK to uh, present that petition. Well, it, it may appear as though the Uyo Studios and the network glitch is interfering for us to have uh, the conversation we had hoped for. But I, I think, much like I share sentiment with citizen Matthew O'Connor, if uh, that letter was to have the relevance it needed to have, it ought to have been submitted to the United Nations. Exactly. That's the assembly that provides for such conversations. Much like you had said earlier, if there is room for an outlawing of such agitations that cannot be enshrined within a sovereign nation's constitution on the broader platform amongst the committee of states, either at a regional level, should it have been echoers, would have been the better place to start the charity that begins at home with. Now, we're seeing the people's parliament, more like the lower chambers in Nigeria now, begin to entertain conversations for a rotational presidency, the creation of more region and possibly even more states but the challenge now is who is to say that creating more states would not still have issues of marginalization or agitations going into the future because in ideal sense this character of federal principle that we preach in terms of inclusivity for marginalized tribes yes. and ethnic regions even within states today continues to be a big issue in some states since the creation of those states, only a certain ethnic majority have had the privilege of being governors, deputy governors at even where. There are some ethnic minorities that have never tested the seat of power within those states. Now, that is even at a state level. Yes. Now, when you bring it to the federal level, it will still be the conversations of when would it be the town the turn of the southeast to emerge as president? You, you, you know, you know, Beto, one they were, during um you know, good luck at Bella Jonathan's uh, regime where, you know, sadly the former president, uh, Omar Musayaradua, passed on and, you know, good luck had to step into his shoes and then contested for election and won and, you know, carried on with the mantle of dealership. A lot of um, ill-informed Nigerians, you know, said... Oh, good luck is an evil man because he bears the name of Billy. So <laughs> it, it, the, 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 the South East has actually gotten a presidency. But let me correct that notion. The South East has not had a leader either at the uh, State House here in Asorok or the Dodan Barracks in, in, uh, in Lagos during the era of uh, you know, military regime and all for decades. I think the last time there was a proper Igbo leader cheering or championing the affairs of the country in Nigeria was when um, the late uh, Agui, General Agui Ironsi, you know, was head of state and sadly was killed in a coup. And before that, 
of course, Namdi Azikiwe, who was, a, who was known as a ceremonial president and not an executive president as we know presidents to be today. So if you take a look at decades of successive governments in Nigeria, even though riddled by military coups after military coups, you would find out that the military coups have just revolved around northern Nigeria for decades. I don't want to start you know, breaking it down and calling all the names of successive leaders. But you will find that it's either the northern part of the country or the western part of the country. And since the advent of democracy, let's, let's, let's take a look at it from there. First came President Olusegun Obasanjo from the west. Then, of course, Umar Musayar Adwa from the north. Then, good luck, Abele Jonathan from the south-south. And then... Uh, uh, President uh, Muhammadu Buhari from the north and now a Yoruba president or a Westerner who is a Nigerian president. Since the advent of democracy in 1999, there hasn't been an Igbo president. And I think it's one of the things that the, the, the whole beer friend agitation is all about. And I tell you this for a fact. If today an Igbo man becomes a president or a Southerner a Southeasterner becomes a president. I believe the whole agitation around Biafra, the whole agitation around succession would naturally die, die down. They, you would not hear of any such agitations, unless, of course, if there are some miscreants who do not really understand what, they are, what the agitation has been all about. So if the, the whole issue of federal character, the whole issue of um, you know rotation, pre presidential rotation amongst regions, Yes, it's a welcome development, but let's start by fixing what we have at hand right now. Let there be a Southeastern president for the first time since the advent of democracy in the country. When that is done, then we start the rotation. Now, it almost seems as though it's a historical antecedent with the South being very significant in history. Now, dating back to 1860, when they had the U.S. Union. The term cessation became even more relevant when 11 southern states applied to formally withdraw from the U.S. Union. This event led up to the Civil War back in the 1860s. Now, coming to modern day, it is a system of government that we have adopted, borrowed, and reshuffled. Borrowing leaves from the British and also taking leaves from the Americans. We seem to not have found the balance either in implementing a parliamentary system or a presidential system. Now, going forward, has been calls, particularly from the Southeast, that the position of presidency is key in quelling these agitations. And now, whilst there is patriots within the National Assembly building up the momentum for the conversation to be had, it is still falling back on the path of the need to review Nigeria's constitution and make provisions for a referendum. Now, then going forward, this is also the cause for autonomy even at the local government level to seem to be working. But remember, it's a political concept. And whilst there is need for a federal character principle, if certain minority groups do not have their chance at filling leadership positions, particularly elected positions, these conversations will continue to be had. And in the interim, whilst they had, one of the loudest agitations over time has been IPOB. Up until now, the federal government, in keeping with the need to respect the rule of law, still has Namdi Kanu in incarceration. Now, the conversations are that going into the future, how would these conversations be treated with equity in keeping the peace in Nigeria? Now, leaving IPOB for once and coming back to the Niger Delta, Citizen Matthew O'Connor, before he was abruptly cut off in making his comments, talked about the temptation of lumping up a bomb and part of the south southeastern states with the IPOB movement. He tried to create a distinguishing factor between what the agitations of Niger Delta states are, as it were. But whilst this is the case, let us refer back to the upper chambers, the Senate. The Senate is entertaining com uh, conversations of renaming the NDDC, which is more like a microcosm of the Niger Delta region in terms of oil being yes. its key factor. Yes. This 
I'm thinking would also create another room for conversations of how long the movement of the Niger Delta has been before oil has now been discovered in some northern states. And with this new nomenclature, whatever they choose to give the new NDDC, how does the Niger Delta region fight for its determining rights in the soon-to-be new Nigeria? Well, when, when you say the soon-to-be new Nigeria, I, with the I, new constitution I, the, at well, hand. well, with the new constitution at hand, um, I, I think as much as we would want to um, ignore the fact that the agitations of the Niger Delta people is one that uh, has been quite sad, I, for one, uh, having known the history of, uh, you know, how the agitation started since the advent of uh, the discovery of oil in the region, and, you know, the, the, the past uh, the heroes of the agitation who sadly lost their lives, like uh, the, the likes of Ken Sarawiwa and, and you know, uh, all of that, you know, in the pro process of these agitations. However, in terms of renaming uh, NDDC, yes, it is important to rename NDDC, but we do not know what the Senate plans to rename it to yet. And we do not know the responsibilities that NDDC will be reassigned with in order to continue the drive and the push for, you know, the, the uh, actualization of some of the cries and yearnings of the Niger Delta people. And what are these cries and yearnings? Of course, the, the oil cleanup of the region, which has affected millions of lives within the Niger Delta, Delta region. That is one. Uh, and secondly, for these top international oil companies operating, the likes of Shell and the rest, operating within the region, to ensure that the people that own the land upon which the oil in Nigeria is being tapped from enjoy to maximum extent the wealth that is being gotten from their land. These are the simple agitations and I don't know why for many many decades these agitations that appear to you know be quite simple to offer the Niger Delta people have been withheld from uh, from from them for a very long time. So yes, it's it's good that the Senate renames it, but the Nigerian people, most importantly, the Niger Delta people, want to know what it is going to be renamed as and what the new roles will be in their agitation. Well, it's down history lane and not to sound like a historical class, but this secession agitation started right after Nigeria was amalgamated. Um, um, and up until the civil war between 1960 to 1967, and it has not ceased. Many continue to look at Nigeria as an unholy marriage. If you ask them why, it is based on religious sentiments, ethnic opinions, and these conversations continue to elicit growing reactions day by day in Nigeria. The aim of this conversation is to find a common ground in balancing our nationhood in light with the peculiar challenges affecting different regions. Now, six geopolitical zones as we know it, the concept of a new Nigeria is gaining grounds. Would there be more regions? Would there be more states? Would the rotation of presidency become a thing? All this for now continue to remain speculations. Whilst the People's Parliament, the National Assembly as we have it, is the body that has been given the mandate to carry the aspirations and yearnings of Nigerians in fostering a one united and harmonious Nigeria. There have been political ideologies that have been birthed in issues like the federal character principle which becomes a recurrent conversation. But as a federating unit with federating states, separationist is also another ideology, although rumored along the corridors, seems to be gaining grounds in different regions. This morning, we've looked at the issue of the IPOP. We've looked at the key factors in play with Namdi Kanu and Simon Ekpa, who continues to more or less spearhead his own ideologies away from that of Namdi Kanu. And coming down to the southwest, where we have the Yoruba agitation of the Oduduwa people and the Oduduwa Republic, is also the issues with the Niger Delta. Now, many talk about the wounds that have not been. Uh, atoned for or the sins that are yet to be atoned for with an injustice that was done to a people and many talk about the fact that if this injustice is not atoned for 
we cannot have the grounds for the one harmonious Nigeria we look for. Now, this brings us to some of the injustice that was said to have been done to the people of the Southeast, particularly to the Igbo people, where post-Civil War, they were given... 20 pounds. Away from the wealth they had before the Civil War. They've been able to rebuild, but this issue with the movement for the actualization of the sovereign state of Biafra continues to be hinged on that perceived injustice. Well, the, um, amongst the Igbo people, I would tell you clearly that there is um, a clear divide between people who have experienced the war and people who want to experience succession as it stands now. And one thing that people who have experienced the war, especially elder statesmen or elders in, the, in that particular region, will tell you is, yes, the war happened. Yes, there was a reason for the war to have happened, but they would rather it had not happened due to the devastating effects and the toll it took on you know, the lives and businesses of many people back then. And what did the federal government do after the Civil War? The people who had lost millions of hundreds of millions of Naira in businesses, billions of Naira in businesses, billionaires who had lost their monies due to the effects of the war were asked to, you know, remit all, because at some point the, there was, of course, the, the Biafran pounds and all, they were asked to remit all those monies to banks. And while these monies were being remitted, every single one of them was handed out a 20 pound note to start off afresh. The entire region. Whether you had 1,000 Naira in the bank, whether you had 10 million Naira in the bank, you were handed out 20 pounds. Now, I'll also give kudos to uh, the then administration of uh, General Yakubu Gowon that uh, came about with the three R's program, the uh, rehabilitation, reconstruction, and uh, re reintegration. But a lot of people argue that, in as much as you know, these uh, three uh, the three R's project was kicked off. The last part of the R, which was the rehabilitation, never really took place. Because it appears that the, the Igbo people were never really rehabilitated, rehabilitated fully back in, in, reintegrated, I beg your pardon, back into the Nigerian society. And that is why you see the effect, the ripple effect, where till today there isn't a president from the Southeast since the Civil War. They are antecedents to all of these things. Yes, the, 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 the southeastern people still live in Nigeria, still carry out their businesses. Many have moved on from the 20 pounds that, that they were handed on to, to to become billionaires today. However, in terms of governance, in terms of you know federal politics, the most revered seats in the country, the Igbo people have not been reintegrated back into the Nigerian political space ever since then. Now, and it's a big timeline, and much like Chijoke has rightly pointed out, the timelines in the agitations, particularly the year that gave prominence to all these agitations, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is, in my best opinion, 2007, under the presidency of the late President Umaru Musayer Adua, when MEND, the movement for the emancipation of the Niger Delta, gained momentum almost side by side, Masob. Now, Masop went a step further. They also had their international passport as a yen for by Biafrans in diaspora. It was shut down by the government. But it was late 2012, 2013, thereabout, that IPOB now began to gain relevance. Now, the ideologies of these different groups and the agitations continue to be based on some credible misgivings and grievances of the past. And it's safe to say that in going forward, we would have hoped to have legal perspective from Barrister Mfon Ben and also from a citizen's angle from citizen Matthew O'Connor, or both of whom were in our OYO studios, but owing to our poor network connection this morning, we do apologize for not being able to reconnect with them and have them share their thoughts. But to you, our viewers who have followed the program, if you have any opinions on this issue, feel free to comment on our live stream on our YouTube channel on, on our webpage as well. And remember to keep it civil. Do not use information or inciting comments when you look to express your thoughts. And help profess solutions as to how we can achieve the Nigeria of our dream. Or should I say the new Nigeria 
in light of a new conversation. Uh, this is as much as I have on the subject. I don't know if you have any other parting shots to add as we look to close. Well, well for me, um, there isn't really much to say other than the fact that um, Nigeria as a country, I beg to differ when people say Nigeria is a, an, a forbidden marriage. An unholy marriage. An unholy marriage, sort of. We didn't come about as a country by chance. There must have been some sort of uh, uh, actual benefits or need for this country to have come together. And now that we have come together, uh, the whole issue of the Odudua People's Republic, the whole issue of Yoruba Nation, the uh, uh, IPOB agitations, the movement for the actualization of the sovereign state of Biafra, uh, people agitating for the Niger Delta region to have its own... Um, the whole self self actualization and all yes these agitations are born out of grievances towards the federal government to and who is the federal government if you ask the federal government presidents stem from these particular regions so if we will as a people set aside these differences and understand that there isn't a southeast there isn't a southwest there isn't a niger delta there isn't a northeast there is a Nigeria then at that point when we begin to see Nigeria as Nigeria and not regionalize the way we do it in our minds then we can better move our country forward and have a level playing ground where every southerner every westerner every northerner every easterner has the same fair share in the country well thank you very much Chijo Keo Kafo and uh, for myself Beto Brian it's been the much we can take on this topic we had hoped that would have more insights from our Uyo studios.